creation. In the beginning, God created. That's as far as you need to go with it. In the beginning, God created everything. Everything that was ever made, he made it. And when we look at Revelations 22, 21, and 20, he who testifies about these things say, yes, I am coming quickly. That's Jesus speaking. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus will, will be with all the saints. Amen. You know, I can talk to a thousand people and not get near as nervous as I do up here talking to just a handful of people I've known for a long time. But I'm hoping that maybe I will settle down a little bit sooner or later, probably after I croak. But I know EM, EMS is back there. They're waiting for me. No, I should have learned a long time ago, don't hang around pastors. Because they always find something for you to do that you don't think you can do. And they find stuff that they think you can do that you can do. We just got to be willing to serve our church and our pastor. That's what servant's all about is, is serving those that you love and help them through their trials. <laughs> a little bit about me I was ordained a deacon in 1974 I was in my mid 20's but that same thing hanging around with that pastor got me going to different places I've been through the homeless shelter there in Dallas and everywhere he went at revivals I was there I was his right hand man be so young to be thrown into all this stuff it puts kind of a load on your little brain but after a while it starts fitting in and you find a new love that you didn't realize you had before a new love for Jesus that just can't explain it but anyway uh, pastor got me to agree to teach swap that's seniors with a purpose and we learned early in our class that Moses was 80 years old when he led the people out of Israel, I mean out of Egypt, to the, to the promised land. Moses never got to get into the promised land, but he did get to see it from afar. And he was 120 years old when he died. They buried his bones so the devil couldn't find it. The devil never didn't know where the bones were. And a little bit about tithing. I know it's a, it's a tough subject sometimes. But it's so important. It's important for the welfare of the church to be able to afford these blue, what do you call these things? Views. Nice brown carpet. All the woodwork here that, that Ronnie did with the help of a bunch of friends. And uh, the tithe, just to give you something to think about, think about the Garden of Eden where all the fruit trees out there that was in the garden there was one in the middle that they couldn't touch and that was God's tithe when they touched it death came upon mankind Adam and Eve were kind of they were set up to live forever in a beautiful garden but you know like men do we, uh, we blow it we give up a good thing then you think about the 30 pieces of silver silver that was the tithe that went to the storehouse that they paid Judas. They stole it, gave it to Judas to turn in Christ Jesus. But when he'd come to give it back, they wouldn't take it back because it was blood money, and they knew it. They weren't going to put that back in the house. There are so many other examples of that in there about tithing God you know Jesus when he was tested in the, in the desert for 40 years the devil told him to jump off the cliff and he let the angels catch him and he said do not test the Lord thy God it is written but God says on the tithe test me 
That's the only time that God has ever asked us to test him is on the tithe. It's that important. And when you give a tithe, you're not just supporting this church. Our pastors, our youth directors, and all this, you're also supporting missionaries. And every so this one to the Lord, you become a part of it. That's your, that's your contribution to the body of Christ. We've all got talents. Ain't nobody in here don't have a talent. You just got to find out what it is, what God's gifts are to you, and use them for his glory. And they'll magnify you. The church on the, is one of my favorite subjects, basically, because I guess we're all the church. It's old saying, don't be a church goer, be the church. And when you're the church, things start happening in the community. You start seeing people come in, be blessed, salvation. There's been a ton of people sal- uh, saved here at this little church since I've been here. And it's a wonderful thing. Some of them never come back again, but we, at least we know they left with something. And without our tithing and our offerings, we, we, we couldn't have that. So pat yourself on the back. Yeah. Then I got to meet a nice gentleman over there, kind of a caveman type guy. But I love him like he's one of my own kids. Then I met Josh, wherever he's at. He's probably back with the other kids. Then I got, you know, Charlie and Diane, D, and what's your, what was your, HD? HD, heavy duty and light duty. And uh, Sam, Valerie, Dennis, Cheryl, and uh, oh, there's so many folks around here I know, like Mama back there, Mama Hicks, Angela. Angela went to, went to uh, high school with my son, and Ronnie, and the EMS is here too. But I, that does that does me good to realize that. <laughs> But in our class, we talked about on the first Pentecost, that was 50 days after they left Egypt. Uh, The word Pentecost means 50 days. 3,000 people died. Uh, On the day of Pentecost, 10 days after Christ ascended back up into heaven, they had another Pentecost, and 3,000 people were saved. So power of God, I like to see that power come back when fiery tongues come over everybody and they start speaking like crazy people and people get saved throughout this community. That would be great. The first church, of course, uh, showed up in Jerusalem. It was the first one. And then... Uh, Sometimes I can't read my writing. I write real small, then I can't read it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 4, 5, and 6, we are taught the gifts, the nine spiritual gifts. And um, these gifts were given to the church. That's you and me. And we need to figure out which one of it is that we have and use it for Christ. The church, our church is huge. It's not just this group of people here. Uh, like I put in there, it, it, the church could start with one person and end up being 1.4 billion known Christians throughout the world. And they're not all Baptists. They're not all non-denominationalists, they're not all Catholic, they're not all Presbyterian. Um, It's just a group of people that are part of the body. And we should look at each other. Just think of them as the whole church under one Lord, Jesus Christ. Because one day we're going to meet all together and celebrate as one unit. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 6, there are different kinds of gifts, but it is the same Holy Spirit who gives them. So what are we got 
God, the Holy Spirit has given it to us. So we need to use it. We need to use it for the glory of God. Um, I'll get back on my notes here. <laughs> yeah, we do. You look at my notes. I write like a doctor. <laughs> Dr. Ken. <laughs> Dr. Rich. And the church in Antioch, Antioch that was Acts eleven twenty six was the first time we were called Christians. Uh, and there's like three different, three or four different descriptions of what a Christian is. Sometimes we get all hooked up on certain things, but it's, it could be people other way, followers of Jesus, or Christ-like. And what we all strive for, back in 73, I used to teach my teenagers to strive to be more like Christ. And stay in church. I should have listened. Since 1986, I kind of fell away and not, not proud of it. And then one day in, cl in class, we were talking about the seven deacons that they ordained at, Ante at uh, Jerusalem to help feed the people there, to feed the church, because there was already grumblings by the, I can't remember what, what they called them, uh, but they're all grumbling because certain people wasn't getting fed and things like that. And so they ordained ordain seven people. And the word deacon means one thing, that's servant. It's not a high and mighty title. It's a, to be a servant to the church, to God, to our pastors. It's not to be the ruler of the church but it's to be a helpmate to the church. And it turned the apostles loose where they could get out and do their job, and that was to build churches everywhere. And you think about the seven churches in Revelations 1 through 3, there's only two churches that are in ruins, and the reason why the one in... And the one in Sardis, you read about that in Revelations, they were dead. And uh, the one in Pergamos was the seed of Satan. So those two churches are in line of ruins where the other five, as of 2007, are still going strong. This has been over 2,000 years, and they're still going. The power of God, you know, we read that... Uh, and um, can you hear that? <laughs> okay, I didn't know. <laughs> anyway, anyway, I think Sister Lori put that down here for me. She's such a good person at doing this. Matthew sixteen eighteen. And I tell you that, Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And the powers of hell will not prevail against it. And you look at the other, at another verse in here. Um, mm, mm, mm. I saw it. Or did I have a to it? Good grief. Lord, don't let me mess up. That's what I keep saying. <laughs> yeah, uh, talking to y'all don't really bother me a whole lot. 
but it's representing that cross it bothers me sometimes because I feel like I'm unworthy. Anyway, this is, I know it's right here. I had this all lined out. Sometimes our best plans just <laughs> goes down the tube. In other words, the, the church is built on apostles, pastors, teachers. You find it? This family is built on the teaching of missionaries, the early preachers. Jesus Christ himself is the cornerstone. That was what I was looking for. Just to prove what we just read in Matthew, that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and he's the rock that he's talking about in Matthew. If you read the Bible long enough, you start seeing little things that back up other things. And you just sometimes it's amazing what, it's what happens. It just amazes you. What's wrong, Trey? What's wrong with you? You all right? <laughs> I lost all fear just then. <laughs> Hebrews, Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 says to provoke love and good works to one another to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. And so much more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? Anybody know? Everybody know what day it is? It ain't hump day. <laughs> the day of the Lord, that's going to be a terrible day for some. Some of us is going to be a little bit teary-eyed for a while because we'll look on the one that we kind of set aside a few times in our lives, and we'll think about that. But he he forgives us. All you got to do is ask him. If you want to know anything about anything, just ask him. Sometimes he'll let you know things you wish you had never known because it cuts deep. As he's like a Double-edged sword is razor sharp that cuts you clean to the bone. And that cut can really go deep. There is one body and one spirit even as you are called in one hope of your calling. We were called to do something in Colossians 3.15, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Galatians 3.28, 1 Corinthians 12.13, 1 Corinthians 12.12, 12. Speak of one body with Christ Jesus as the head. In John 10, 16, and other sheep I love. Not to, wasn't talking just about the Jesus. He's talking about you and me. Which are not from this fold. Them I also must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And thus shall be one fold and one shepherd. And I tell my wife a lot of times, every once in a while I hear the, Spirit, of, I mean, I hear the voice of God in my, in my head, and she thought I was kind of crazy. I've never heard that, and I know I'm a born-again Christian, but one day she lost her uh, engage, I mean, her, her wedding ring, about eight grand worth, and she went searching through the house, tearing everything out, and she, she, I stopped, and I just was quiet for a little bit, and the voice said, go look in the trash can. So she went outside, <laughs> right there on the top was her wedding ring. Oh, wow. So she learned what the voice of God is. <laughs> I've heard it so many times, Ken, don't do that. 
Kenneth Eugene, I'm going to tell your mother. And on and on, and my granddaughter, and when she gets mad at me, she calls me Kenneth Eugene. I'm sure, I'm sure Addie will one of these days, too. Yeah, I've asked God for questions for a lot of years. In a lot of years, I've got a lot of different answers. But the one answer I got that says, you're forgiven, and I love you. And that's the best, best one of all of them. Okay, that, that's just about it. Yeah, this book, this Bible right here, is made up of 66 books, 31,103 verses, 8,352 are prophetic. And the prophecy in this book, all but two on Jesus, has been fulfilled. 300, over 360 of them, just about Jesus, has been fulfilled. We're waiting for the building of the temple. And when you see that, brother, be ready. And don't let anybody misguide you either, because all these people now, you go on YouTube and since... 2001, I've been here and Jesus is going to come tomorrow. Well, it's not true. Jesus is going to come when we least expect it. And when we think he's never going to come, then he'll show up. As long as there's people's souls to be won, he's going to be holding back until that day when everything just goes evil. The only thing when everybody's like the time of Noah. And when everything is evil, that's all people think about is evil things. Proud, boastful. Right now we're seeing it proud, boastful. Earthquakes in diverse places. We're seeing it all over the world. And this happened before. Uh, it's just part of the earth, I guess. Cause when Jesus comes back, you're going to see no wrath like that one ever. And I just thank God that we're not going to be a part of it. <laughs> Uh, anyway, that's all I've got for tonight. If y'all last longer than I thought I would, yeah. Okay, Robert, uh, it's up to you.